So yeah, I am back. You get to hear me more. Uh, so one of the things that we've done, so Puppet historically, what we do is we pick up the from the OS being installed and we do the operating system and the applications and provisioning after you've already got an operating system. And there's a bunch of different ways that people would handle that first part, be it kickstart, be it images, you know, Blake images, but we're like, we're like, we're gonna solve your golden image problem by saying build the most boring generic image possible and let us take it from there, but I'm not gonna solve making the image in the first place. Well, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people that are like, hey, I'm now operating in two different systems, I have to do something here, and then that kicks Puppet and the rest happens over there in Puppet. But it's not all one intuitive system, and it's more stuff for me to manage. And Puppet does, didn't officially support anything that might have been a problem with your handoff or any of that. So now, with Puppet, we've decided, okay, we're gonna move into this area, because it's really all the same situation of getting you from a bare, uh, bare metal box or a bare VM loaded all the way up to having your entire system up and running. So wh what we did in the last, uh, last month is we officially brought three projects in to be Puppet supported. One is called Razor. How many of you guys are familiar with Razor? So Razor's been in beta for like two years. Uh, we're not quite Google where we leave it in beta forever, but we left it there for quite a long time. Uh, and I'll get into that. And then the other two are AWS and Docker. Uh, and Docker may not be your traditional kinds of provisioning, but certainly been a lot big buzz lately. Uh, and our ability to manage that is something that uh, a lot of people have been really excited about. Uh, we are continuing to work on to bring more platforms to be supported. I believe up next uh, they're talking about uh, vCenter and Azure. Uh, but that's our goal as we're moving forward is to be able to manage all of these systems. And hopefully as you're you know, we can make a lot of this code as reusable as possible between some of these systems so that, you know, as you're migrating between platforms, again, we wanna make sure that we're allowing you to as quickly and easily abstract the end resource and what happens on the back end away from your puppet code and what you're doing so you can, you know, focus on the big pictures and the exciting stuff and not on the day-to-day -day activities or the provisioning or the repeated tasks. Uh, so I'm gonna show all three of those that we just brought into supported for you. Uh, and we're gonna start off with Razor. So I'll explain a bit how Razor works, and then I will actually show it do something. So here, is this, is this big enough yet, or does this need to be bigger? Cool. So, and you know what? I actually have slides for this, so let's look at that first. Boom. But I was just saying, we control a bunch of stuff. Uh, and so first off, here is Razor, uh, and kind of the steps that we're going through here. Uh, Razor is kind of, you think of it about kind of as Kickstart and steroids. With Kickstart, you know, you pick boot up, and then you've got an IP and a MAC address, and you figure out what you're gonna apply into that system, and you go from there, and it better be Linux. Uh, <laughs> And then hopefully something happens at the end. Uh, what we do is we run a little micro kernel. Uh, it's a little CentOS uh, 7 kernel that gets installed, and then we run Factor. And you get all the power that I talked about Factor before. I now can know, you know what CP, how many CPUs are on this system, how much memory is on this system, what disks are on this system. And I can take all of that Factor data to then intelligently make decisions of, well, what should this guy actually be? And then I could also say, because I can manage these things even after they're created, it's not simply build it and then throw it away and never think about it again. I can say, well, what I really need is I need two database servers, which would be like this. I need 14 uh, web servers, and I need two HA proxy servers. And, even, and they might be slightly different sort of configurations, but they might be identical hardware. So how would I differentiate those systems? Well, in Razor, I can, ha I can say that I need this many boxes to exist of this type, and once it hits that magic number, it's gonna go down the list and start making the next matching type and go on there. And I can also have nothing matching and just have a system that'll sit there with a microkernel, <coughs> pinging, waiting to go and say, hey, have I been defined yet? Have I de been defined yet? 
and the moment you define it, it'll start stalling. So you can have hardware that's almost kind of like a cold standby right there, and you can just classify and things will come up. And then I can say to a system that it still already exists, I can be like, well, I actually need to reinstall these boxes. And I can go into Razor and tell Razor, reinstall these nodes. I reboot them. It'll hit Pixie. So by default, we just leave Pixie as the front, as the first boot option. Every single time, it'll boot into that Pixie box. And Razor, if it knows it, will say, hey, just go to your next boot order. If it doesn't know it or it's set to reinstall, then I can reinstall. And the nice thing about Razor is I can install not just Linux, but I can install Linux, Windows, and ESXi uh, onto that, that system. So let's get out of here and look at the magic of Razor. Why do I not have a mouse? All right, so the way Razor does this, uh, that matching is off tags. And so this is my incredibly boring tag called is it virtual? Uh, which will match all of my VirtualBox systems. Uh, but I can look at, so let's go Razor nodes. I can see the nodes that exist. And I can look at more detail about these. And then look at the facts that I collected on the system. And so I can see, here's all the information I collected by default. And then since this is a Linux system on here, uh, we have these hooks and brokers. I can also throw in some additional, uh, if I need to grab something else or I need to throw a driver on there uh, or I need to do something unique, I can throw that in there and have that happen as well if it's not just a simple throw the OS up. So what happens is the, and let's actually start this thing booting because it'll take a while. And all I'm doing is I'm launching my Vagrant box so you don't really need to read that text. Don't strain your eyes. And here. So we, I don't know that I can make this any bigger, so I apologize for that, but I'll tell you what's going on. Uh, so it goes out and does a Pixie, uh, and then that, the Pixie box on the Razor server responds. Uh, and says, hey, you should have this image. It's pulling down that microkernel image that I mentioned. Uh, and then it's going to start actually loading the system, which is going to take a minute. So while it's doing that, we'll come back here. And so, so we hit, saw Razor tags. It's going to match that. And then you'll write a policy. The Razor, let's make this wider. I write a policy that has several pieces of the policy. It has tags, so I can have multiple tags here. I can do an, a lo Boolean logic of or, and, match all my tags. I say the maximum number that I want like this to exist, uh, and then I can create multiple policies here and reorder them so that they'll happen in a different order. And then the repo and the task are where I'm telling it what operating system to install. So if I do Razor repos, I can see all I've done here is I've told it, hey, grab this ISO off here and my Razor tasks. There's a bunch of built-in tasks to handle common operating systems you might want to deal with. Uh, but these basically tell it what to install. And then I can come in here if I need to throw like an answer file or something different. I can make a modify my task to get there. Uh, and so let's go back to Razor policies. And then after the operating system's up, the broker is, hey, it's up. Now what do I do? If I don't care, I can just leave it. But I probably care because I wanted to do something more than just be installed. So I'm going to do something. And by default, those brokers that we've got is install Puppet Open Source or install Puppet Enterprise. Uh, but you can do any arbitrary task you'd want to do after the, the box is up. And then that'll do that handoff there to the next step. So I can do. Razor brokers here, let's see, boom, this is my configuration I want to pass it. So yeah, I've got the broker type, I've got what information I want, I can hand it something else if I need. Uh, so you didn't see here, but once that thing loaded all the way up, 
Uh, it then ran factor, and so now if I do razor nodes, I will wait a while and hope that something happens. There we go. So you see I now have a new node on here, node 9. And I know some stuff about it, so I can look at node 9. And you can see it matches this tag, because once it was able to run a factor, it's found a tag to match, and that tag matched the policy. And so it said, great, I know what you are, reboot. And it reboots, and the next time a pixie boots up, I'm now going to match the DHCP address. I'm going to be like, hey, I know that you are currently your installed state is false, and that I, what, I have a policy that says what you should be. And so I'm going to now hand you that ISO that we, had, that we pointed to on our repo instead of handing you, you know, my microkernel and get everything set up, stood up and installed. Uh, and then once I've got this box all the way up, this installed state will change to true. And like I said, every single time now when this box reboots, it's going to first pixie. Razor's going to see it. Razor's going to say, hey, I know you. I don't need to do anything. Don't pixie. Go do the next thing. And then it'll boot up the actual operating system. But I can do a Razor uh, reinstall node. Like, believe it's. Is it name or not name? No, yeah, it's. So here, I'm now said, hey, the installed flag is cleared. The next time, which node 8 doesn't exist in my system anymore, but if it did, when it reboots, it would start laying down that operating system again. So if you, you know, it, here, instead of updating your operating system and patching it all the way, or you know, trying to go between CentOS 6 and CentOS 7, I can just start saying, hey, I need to reinstall all these boxes. I've got a new policy that would install the new operating system instead of the old one. Put that on there. And then I can go selectively to my different systems and reboot them. And when they reboot, they'll install the new operating system. Puppet will get installed on the end, and we can do the classification after that. Yes? Does sending that to <coughs> statically to either higher or lower infrastructure? In this instance, <laughs> this is doing DHCP. What's providing DHCP? On, so on this spot, so the question was, is it statically providing the IP? And since it's not, then uh, what's providing DHCP? Uh, this is classic Pixie. What you would want to do is, in your DHCP, put an option 66 to point over to the Pixie server. Uh, in this particular instance, I'm running DNS mask to run a lightweight uh, DHCP server off this box as well. Uh, but in production, I imagine you'd be using something a lot more enterprise. And like I said, just option 66 to point at the, uh, the Pixie box, and it should go from there. Cool. So this is still going, but it should take a minute. Uh, yep, and so there I just finished the installation, rebooting. We'll see. We pixie boot again, and we say, nope, go to your operating system. I know you're installed. And I can actually see here node 9. Now, this should say installed is true, but it's not updating. Uh, so, anyways, yeah, I can have the actual operating system. It's going to come up here. And then once this loads on this very first boot, because my broker was installed Puppet Enterprise, it's going to install that in there. So do my classification. Uh, I've got on my autosign.conf, on my master, I am doing a super secure, if you named it like this, I'm going to sign it. <laughs> uh, which means to get in there. But you know, I've written uh, custom um, autosign scripts that can actually do the same Razor query. And so you can check and see, like, hey, is this box really something I provisioned in Razor? Or did this come in some other way to have some malicious user trying to build a system on, uh, for me? And I can see, and you can do the query against that to be like, 
hey, does this box really exist or not? And they can go to Razor and Nodes and you know, whatever the node name is and find it uh, in order to ensure that it, it's secure and it should be what it is. And so yeah, the rest of that classification should be going on here. If I seven, and it's called host eight here. So in the policy, I said what the name name it, and I'm naming them. It's seen as it's seen as nodes over there, but it does name it as whatever I call it. You have a question? Right, yeah, no, the HC. So the question is sometimes uh, systems will get stuck in a loop where they fail to complete the install and they reboot and they pixie boot again. Uh, like I said, the difference with Razor versus like a Kickstart or WDS, where if you pixie boot into that, it's probably going to take it. Here, I'm expecting you to pixie boot the first time. So I have a conscious, I'm paying attention that these nodes exist. And so I can come here into the the razor on the console, I can see that, hey, this box keeps trying to install. You know, by default, there's no alerting that's going to go on there, but I could specify that kind of alerting level if I wanted to be like, hey, this box never gets to an installed state. It just keeps trying and trying. Exactly, and that's the, kind of the advantage of paying attention to the box after you know you just did that initial run. Do you have a question? Or? Yeah, so the mini, the mini OS that comes out, uh, customizes it and says, these are the changes you need. So, so the, you know, odd things you guys do, like pushing forward. Yeah, so Puppet, you know, there's the Razor's open source. You, know, you can log on and do whatever you want, really. What Puppet Enterprise is supporting is just this one kernel. However, because I can create in, uh, no, that's the wrong book. Yeah, it's just an I, it's, it's a kernel file. There's nothing. Yeah, it's totally could be done. But so these hooks on here, I mean, that's, if I need to throw drivers in or something like that, I can do that without modifying the kernel, like that micro kernel. Exactly. Like if I need to do a little script, if there's, yeah, if there's some screwy thing you need to do, I try to do it first through the hooks and the brokers and avoid changing the kernel because then you have to maintain it. And it, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, it's, if you want to, if you do want to go in there and muck with it, it's an open source project that's out there. You can grab it. So yeah. Uh, and there's one thing. So the, on the enterprise side, there's a PE only module called PE Razor that installs Razor and gets that all set up. Uh, there's also there's a, another open source module that's out there that tries to do the same thing. Uh, the nice thing about the, the Lava Burn wrote the open source one. Uh, the PE one only does uh, standing the thing up. Uh, the Lava Burn one you'd end up using even if you, although it needs to be updated for 3.8. It's, you know, pull requests I've been meaning to write and haven't done. Uh, but the module allows you to specify in Puppet Code uh, all these, envir these tags and the policies and all that. So I've in my demo. I've actually here, let's look at params. Yeah, I can say you know, what the repos are and what the brokers are. You know, again, trying to move this stuff into puppet code. Uh, and so there's, there is a module in the forge that uh, helps you accomplish this. Uh, so you can put stuff here or you can put it, what, and the way I've, I'm actually trying to pull this here is 
Uh, I've got Hira hash. So I can, you can throw into Hira all this information and then use a Hira hash to grab all this stuff from your different data centers and figure out what it, what it should be to build your razor, your razor configurations and keep that stuff again because if you're going in there and you're manually creating those tags, suddenly you've created a snowflake, recreating your razor box is annoying. Try to stick it in here. Take advantage of the lava burn razor module and you can do that. Uh, Cool. And so yeah, this is this box is up. And then if I even went over here, because this box is also running my Nagios, and by default, my Linux boxes all should have certain things monitored. It should show up. Oh, it'll end up showing up on this side, but I'm going to jump to the next item. Uh, so I can, like I said, it's, you know, that's advantage with the classifier, not doing it in host names. I can have my whatever rules get applied, and it can grab that box and automatically know, hey, I need to start monitoring this box now. Cool. So let's go look at AWS. Uh, so one of the other things we did in the provisioning side is we came, we brought, we completely rewrote and brought up to be fully supported our AWS module. So now, uh, and something that Ryan had also touched on this morning, I can not only specify EC2 instances, I can also specify things like load balancers uh, or all the other like so all the sorts of the you know the VPC like anything that you're going to want to have in your AWS environment. I can specify those in puppet code. So now when I say like, hey, we're growing, I've got a bunch of people over in EMEA, like I need to go run, recreate my application in another data center over in Europe. You can use Hira to pull out the different variables for what's different between those two and stand up an entire data center in AWS all in puppet code and keep things con uh, consistent. You can either sort of manage that this is the, the readme on that module. Uh, there's two ways. You can come in here and create an AWS credentials file on whatever box. So what you end up doing is we basically have a proxy box. It's sort of how Puppet Device worked, if I ever tried using that, where I apply the Puppet code onto, a, onto one box that is my proxy, which will then go out and talk to my AWS infrastructure. Uh, I can do this in two ways. I can have this AWS credential, or I'll give it the credentials it needs to actually get in there. Or I can use the uh, identity account management, the IAM, on and create a profile over an EC2 uh, that actually gives that box uh, this, the permissions it needs here. I created this role so that I don't even have to have, I'm not dumping credentials onto that system because I've got my master running in AWS. I can say, hey, that particular box has the rights to build other boxes. And you can do it a little more securely that way. Uh, so here, what I've got, uh, let's look at a little more of the code. So coming down here, I can specify instances, security groups, load balancers, all that, and on. Uh, Probably. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to. Like I said, if you, you put that credentials file, you could run it locally. But you know, generally, yeah, security-wise, it makes more sense. And generally, you know, I would rather at least there be a compile master in the same data center as your nodes are, unless you've got like a couple nodes in each location. And most people don't have that instance. They've got a ton of nodes right there. And so you know, the, all that late, if there's latency, that's going to significantly impact how many nodes that, that guy can handle because there's a socket limitation to how many simultaneous requests I could have. So I'd have that closer. You know. Absolutely. All right. So here, let's look at some of the code I've got applied. Production modules TSC. 
So this is a little more complicated. I've you know, done more what you might actually do where I'm pulling variables out instead of just writing in particular nodes. Uh, but here I've created, I'm defining, so we've got these define types here to create different nodes. Ugh. So for Linux, I'm taking in all the information I need and then running this EC2 instance to build that box. So these boxes currently all exist, but this is one of the nice things about using Puppet for your provisioning is if for some reason something crazy happened and my boxes suddenly disappeared on AWS because Amazon likes to kill stuff, uh, then Puppet will look and it will fix that situation. So I can go here. I'm not killing my master, right? Terminate. Yes, terminate these boxes. Now, this one I want to do too. Cool. Let's wait for these things to go away. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I mean, especially you could, if you're using spot instances, they'll definitely kill it, but I mean, there's definitely, there's a lot of times where even if you got a reserved instance, it'll crash or it'll get in a stuck state or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, here I'm defining, Puppet's defined state, so I'm defining I need these boxes to exist, like this many, and what's gonna do here is it's actually gonna, so I, I've def applied that code we're just looking at onto the master itself, so it's become, the master is now my proxy that's looking at that. Uh, but when it does a puppet run, it's going to query AWS, going to say, hey, here's a bunch of nodes that I want to exist. Do they exist and are they running? And if they don't, then it's going to go about creating them. And so I've specified what I've done here. Um, let's connect another to this thing because this is going to take a while. So that, while it's going through and it's doing that, I can see that uh, you know what the code is I'm applying on this box, and it's gonna like I said it's gonna connect in, query to see what's there, and then ended up building those nodes uh, because they don't exist. Do the same thing for on the Linux side or the Windows side here. Again, I just take I just have a define type that wraps this to make it a little easier on me. Oh, and then the last thing it's going to do here is this user data. Uh, so this is where I've gone and I've created a template because, again, you know, having a box up running in AWS only gets you halfway to the battle. You want it to actually do something. So I can create. I run this script here at the very end, and this goes and installs. You know, it reaches out after I do a, a bunch of different things to figure out uh, differences on here. I run this curl command, get uh, Puppet installed on that box. And did Puppet die on here? Service P Puppet Server status. Yeah, that's. Hmm. Running. <coughs> uh, 
Uh, so yeah, so assuming it's going to work, uh, it's going to go out there and it's going to build those boxes and let me know that they didn't exist and that they, I need to do that. And then once those things come up, they'll run that last script, they'll install what they need, and then my classification engine can take over there and say, for whatever rules I've created, I need to do this. From that, um, that user, the template I had in there as well, the user data, or you know, with some tags, I could go in there, I could add some additional information to classify it, so I'd say like, tag app server, and then use a custom fact to grab that tag, and then use that to do the rest of my classification. So suddenly I don't care about the host name or any of that stuff, I just, when I've built the system, I said I need 10 systems that look like this. Do they exist? Great. And they'll get classified automatically all the way through like that. I don't know why you're timing out. Now, let's give that a second. I'll start talking Docker. So the last thing that we've done is we created a, the Gareth had a, was a puppet employee in, I believe in London, uh, created a Docker module, which is on the Forge, it's supported, or it's approved on the Forge, uh, and we brought it into being uh, puppet, uh, puppet supported. Uh, normally, I find this kind of funny, oftentimes when we've moved modules from ones that our staff has written to puppet modules, we've pulled all the code across, and then sort of decommissioned their old one on the forge and said, don't use this anymore. Well, what we did on this one, this, this just makes me laugh. Oh, it's here. If you search for Docker. So you've got Garrus here, and you have Docker platform. This is the supported one, this is the approved one. Well, let's look at what Docker Platform actually has. There's no files in here. Dependencies. It just downloads this particular version of Garrus module. <laughs> but hey, it gets on there. Uh, so here, let me go to my demo module, and we can look at some code. Uh, you can see, I want to show this too here. It's just like the, so getting Docker installed is easy. It's just include Docker and it'll get it set up. Like anything with Puppet, you can kind of reach under the hood and modify something if you want. And then you're creating you know, images. So you can create by specifying the image and what you want done to that. You can also use a specified Docker file. If you've got some additional configuration, you want to put a Docker file. And obviously that could be a template you're pulling from somewhere. Uh, and then docker run to actually run a command. So here, docker, what I've already run on uh, one of these boxes here is to get docker installed and an image downloaded because it's big and I don't want to wait for it. Uh, let's see, did this die again? Let's do service p. Puppet server. Here, so Docker's running on this bo this box, uh, but there's no actual containers running. You can do can see, however, that I did pull in this image here where it specified, hey, pull down Ubuntu and specifically pull down Trusty. Uh, that got pulled down, and then Razor, or sorry, no, Docker. Uh, will give it tags for all the aliases that you might want to use for this. Uh, but you see these are all the same image ID, so it's the same actual image, but it's all this different information. So I could, I could reference it differently if I wanted to. And then I can come in here, and we can uncomment some of these lines. And I can actually launch some containers. Now, My badly written custom fact is yelling at me. Let's 
So you can say these two have been uh, change the status and share running. This is way too wide. Just wait for it to exit here. Okay, this started. Cool, and now I can do Docker PS, and A. Hey, I've got, well, one of them's running. Uh, that's now running on there, and I can do Docker attach here, and I can actually see this is running. Echoing Hello World might not be the most exciting thing you can do with Docker, but this kind of gives you the, the understanding here of like, yeah, I can go into puppet code now and define that my container should exist. It will make sure that they are running, uh, and that they're, and then I can have it all in, in Puppet code. And again, all the advantages of Puppet make it easy to reapply elsewhere. I've also seen clients where they're building, you know, if there's more things that they need to do, or they're writing Docker files to get something, the whole system set up. Well, they'd already set up a lot of those applications with Puppet code before. They're using that Puppet code to sort of create that the image that they're going to then instantiate. And so they can reuse a lot of that information, that work they've already put in, in order to build the system, instead of having to rewrite everything into a Docker file. And cool. Okay, restarting the service. So back at AWS, you can see these three nodes were created. And here, yep, they're up and running. It's created these these systems. They're up and. Pulled in. This is the one that was there before. That's my master. Uh, yep, it's starting to pull in new systems. I just got another license used. So it's going to start pulling these systems into here, and the rest of the classification and management will occur on these boxes. Cool. Well, that was what I had for cradle to grave puppet provisioning. Do you guys have questions? Excellent. Thank you so much, Chris. Absolutely.